So the next thing we're going to talk about is something that is everything we might desire, which is Turing machines. The advantage Turing machines give us is memory. Finite state automata by this property that we could only transition using the current input bit and the current state. Finite state automata have no memory. We don't remember how we got to where we were, we just know that we're there now. So it's everything that finite state automata do, finite state automata, they're kind of like goldfish. Everything they do is purely a reflex. Turing machines, though, have memory. So for this majority function, basically the reason finite state automata couldn't compute majority was we needed to count zeros. The size that that count had to be arbitrarily large. As we had more and more and more zeros, we were going to need more and more and more space to represent that count. So finite state automata, they have no memory, so we have no place to write down what our current count was. Turing machines are going to give us this memory. So this is going to be a more powerful model of computation than finite state automata are. Turing machines are basically, you can think of them as a finite state automaton with memory. So if we have a finite state automaton, we slap some memory on it, we got a Turing machine. Now I sound like a used car salesman. With a Turing machine, we're still going to have our finite number of states just like we have with finite state automata. We're going to see that there is a finite state automaton sort of hidden within a Turing machine. But we're going to have this extra thing available to us, which we're going to call a semi-infinite tape. So we call it semi-infinite because it's infinite in one direction. So it's got a beginning, but no end. So here is our tape. The tape has a bunch of different positions in it where we can store a bit. We have a first bit, we have no last bit. We have no last position on this memory. So our memory is this one-dimensional memory that we're going to call a tape. We have a bunch of locations in this memory where we can store bits. And what we're going to do is, for a finite state automaton, we transition using just the input bit and the state. For a Turing machine, we're going to be able to transition using the state and our current sim on the tape. So we're able to use what we're currently looking at in the memory in order to transition. And the effect that this is going to have is that we're going to be allowed to suddenly reread things. So because we're writing things down, we can go back and look at them later. So because we have memory where we can write things down, we can look at them later. So a Turing machine is a finite state automaton where we have memory that we can read to and write from, and we're able to transition to different states depending on what's in that memory. So let's take a look at basically what's going to be happening here. Inside this Turing machine, we can think about the Turing machine as a finite state automaton looking at this semi-infinite tape. And what it can do is it can look at one location on its tape at a time, make some decision about what state inside its finite state automaton to transition to, and then after it does that, it's allowed to change the memory or change its location, what position in the memory it is currently reading from by either one space, left or right. The way that a Turing machine operates is it says it's in a state. It is looking at a cell in memory. And then using that information, it makes some decision. So it uses this in order to make some decision about what state to go to next. It makes a decision about what to write at that location of memory, and also whether to move left or right in the memory. So that's all that a Turing machine is going to do. It's going to look at its current state, what it's currently reading in memory, and then using that information, it is going to change to a different state, possibly overwrite what it was currently looking at in memory, and then move either left or right in the memory. And the way that we're going to decide which thing to return is there are going to be two special states in the Turing machine. One state we identify as an accept state, a return one state, and one state that we identify as a return zero state. So if we're ever in the return one state, then we just stop computing altogether and return one right then. 
Just like when you're in Python, if you execute a return line in your program, you stop your function and just return right then. In our Turing machine, if we ever enter that accept state, we stop and return one. If we ever enter the reject state, we stop and return zero. So we have these two special states. Accept means return one, reject means return zero. When we start computing, we're just going to say that our memory is sort of preloaded with the input. So we're gonna have a bunch of bits that are just already on the tape. We're going to understand those bits to be the input.